Thanks very much. Well, some really interesting, challenging questions. Uh, I'm not sure I've got all the answers at all, but let me read out um, the questions as we go on. So the first one says this, is it not possible that in some cases knowledge and truth is survival, especially in the modern world? So this is going back to this issue that I raised before about the Darwinian explanation that our brains uh, are there merely to ensure survival. And then, and, and I suppose the, the, question, uh, the questioner is challenging that and saying, well, couldn't it be true that our brains are helping our survival in the modern world? Uh, this is a complicated subject, but basically, the Darwinian explanation is all to do with survival to pass on your genes. And Darwinian explanations really work as we go back into history and into the early history of the human species, but they don't work now. The point is that Darwinian evolution is not happening now. If anything, uh, I have devoted the entire of my life to do precisely the opposite of Darwinian evolution, to ensure that a whole load of babies survived who were, from a Darwinian point of view, completely useless, completely not fit for survival. So I don't think you can... When you start thinking about how the modern world operates, it doesn't operate in a Darwinian way at all, because we've actually intervened uh, in a way that, therefore, uh, Darwinian evolution isn't working. So I don't think you can say that... It, of course, it is true that the way our minds work uh, do help our survival. The fact that I understand about traffic rules means I'm less likely to get run over as I cross the road. Uh, so you can see there is a relationship between survival there, but it doesn't mean that... I mean, if that was the case, then there would be... There isn't selection for people who have better brains compared with the worst brains. That isn't happening in our modern world, I think because basically medicine and the whole of modern society has replaced Darwinian mechanisms in the way that they used to work on the African savannah. So I think that, that would be my answer to that one. Next, an interesting question. Can we argue for the value of human life without reference to God? And of course the answer to that is yes. Um, a great deal of... Um, modern humanistic thinking uh, would argue about the unique value of every human life uh, without any reference to God. Uh, the majority of people who call themselves humanists would not say that they were religious or Christians in any way. The problem, however, is the logical basis for humanism once you take away religion. On, on what basis are you saying that the human species, for instance, the Decla Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that every person has a right to life, that human life of every kind, of every age group, of every, everywhere on the planet, human life must be protected. And the question is, why? What is it about this particular species that says... And, and there are some philosophers who say this is just... Uh, discrimination in favour of a particular species. Peter Singer calls it speciesism. He says there's racism and there's sexism and there's ageism and this is speciesism. And, and that's why he would say that an adult chimpanzee has much more value than a newborn baby. Um, it's nothing to do with species. But you see, the majority of us don't believe that, do we? We think there is something special about being human but my challenge to you is how you can derive that logically and rationally without a religious space. Now, it's not impossible. Philosophers have laboured hard to say, well, it's something to do with you know, creativity and the special status. But then what about the brain-damaged baby? What about the, the person with learning difficulties? We would still want to say they should be protected. We still want to say they're special. So it can't be just about our function. There must be something about being human. And what is it? So I would say that Christianity does provide a rational uh, explanation within its worldview of saying, yes, human beings are unique because they reflect God in a way that other species on the planet, other life forms don't. That, that's the fundamental argument. And in fact, there's a whole number of philosophers who would argue that modern secular humanism is really a Christian heresy. It's, it, it, it's, it's evolved out of Christian thinking. It's just removed the religious foundations. It's kept the, the same 
beliefs about human beings without any religious foundations. The question is, is that going to survive? There are lots of people who think once you chop away that fund, that, those foundations, it's really questionable whether humanism can survive, whether the unique value and status of every single human being can be defended if there's no rational basis to underpin it. So I, I think I would, I would, uh, I would argue that. I wonder if people want to come back to that. Uh, there's a roving microphone, I think, if, if anybody wants to, the person who asked the question or anybody else like to challenge that or uh, ask a question. Well, I speak as a humanist, so <laughs> I'm afraid I disagree with you entirely that there is no rational basis for humanism. You say we have simply removed the Christian belief. Well, yes, in a way we have, but also what we recognize as humanists is the capacity in humans for suffering and our own capacity for compassion. And I think those are quite rational elements in the human persona, if you like to call it that, and that therefore we can base a belief based on just those things without reference to God. Okay, thanks very much. But could I just push back a bit on that? So we think that there are other species who have a capacity for suffering. But so... If other species also have a capacity for suffering, the, the question about why, the, why only the human species should be given reference. So humanists believe they're right for animals, but then you've got a problem. Well, how far does that extend? <laughs> and then there was, but there's the other problem, and that is with the, with the, the brain-damaged human, the, the person who, for instance, baby Christopher, who, who you could argue didn't have the same kind of capacities of many other human beings, are we going to say that those human beings are still special, are still precious, and what's the rational basis for saying that they are? And, okay, all right. Well, thanks very much. Genesis describes a unique creation of the human being. In the context of evolution, what would be your understanding of how Apparently, human beings came from animals. Yeah, thanks. Very good question. And I think my understanding would be that as human beings, that we are related to the pre-human animal species, at some point, God himself intervenes in order to, to give the human being the... Uh, the, the significance, the dignity of personhood. That personhood is ultimately a gift which comes from God, but which is embodied in our humanity. So that at some point in this process of evolution, I think there is the, the origin of the unique persons. Now, precisely, again, how that works is deeply mysterious. I don't have an answer to it. But I think the interesting idea is that the... In, in, the, in the Genesis narrative, uh, it says, let us make. It is, it is a movement out from the Godhead, uh, a being in our image. And that's different from the way that other, in the rest of the creation, it says, let the earth bring forth. Let, but when it comes to human beings, there is this different kind of language, let us make. So that, suggesting that, that that is the unique relationship, which as human beings we have with, with other beings. Okay, shall I go on uh, just to some of the questions that are here? If neuroscience shows us simple things are often wrong, faith has so many simple answers. Isn't faith likely to be wrong? <laughs> and of course, I think the, the short answer to that is yes. Faith in itself is not uh, guaranteed to be right or to be true. The question is what you're putting your faith in. The question is what the beliefs are on. And actually, as I try to demonstrate, everybody has faith because you have to have beliefs in order to do science. Science, scientists have to believe about the order of the universe. They have to believe that it's possible for the human brain to understand that order. They have to believe that uh, they are able to create new theories and so on. All of those are beliefs. So, so the question not is some people have faith and other people don't. The question is we all have faith. We all have beliefs. Everybody's coming from somewhere. 
then the question you have to ask yourself is, what are my beliefs based on, and do they fit the evidence? What is the best? And that's why I was saying you have to follow the evidence where it leads. And what I would suggest to you is that the evidence is actually, I find, more persuasive that there's something unique and special about humans and human persons rather than the other, the physicalist explanation that we are simply neuronal wiring that has no significance, no purpose, no meaning, and we're just here to make sure that we pass our genes on to the next generation. Uh, but in the end, each of us has got to decide where we put our faith, where we put our belief. And uh, there's, there, each one of us, in the end, has to respond to those very deep and challenging questions. Question about AI. What do you feel the consequences of AI will be, and will it be able to replicate human thinking? Well, again, a very, very challenging and, and difficult question. I think there's no doubt that AI is rapidly advancing, the technology is advancing, and therefore the ability to replicate many aspects of human thinking are definitely coming. They're already there, in fact, and in many ways, AIs are already able to do things which human beings are not able to do. For instance, to recognize all those different faces and categorize them and recognize all those emotions, those are abilities which no human is able to do. Do I think that, hum that, that, that machines will be able to replicate completely every aspect of human being? And my answer to that is no, I don't. And I, I think that's science fiction because human beings are fundamentally different from machines. And, you know, we are uh, animals. We are, we are born out of the bodies of other beings. We learn about a physical universe. We reproduce. We understand about death. We understand about suffering. We understand about compassion. Uh, this is part of who we are. Every one of us understands these things in this room. No AI could ever understand any of those things. No, no, no AIs could ever experience any of those things. So to think that an AI is going to be in every way the same, to reproduce exactly the same as human beings, I, I think that is science fiction. But I do think that, that the problem is that the AIs will increasingly simulate. They will appear to be human-like. They will appear to have compassion. They will appear to have empathy. They may even appear to suffer. Um, and this is going to create very challenging and difficult questions for us in society. I even think there may well, for instance, it's been shown that if you take a humanoid robot and you torture a humanoid robot in front of a human being, in front of a scanner, the same brain areas light up in the human observer as if you were torturing a human being. And I think this may mean that there will actually have to be laws and regulations about what you're allowed to do to a robot. Not because you're going to hurt the robot, but because you're actually damaging our humanity. You know, if we allow people to live out the most bizarre fantasies, abuse fantasies, rape fantasies, or whatever with humanoid robots, do we want to be part of a society? that allows that. And so I, I, I think there are very profound and troubling questions here and, and things which I don't have easy answers to. Um, but I would still want to maintain, ultimately, if you go back to the I-it relationship and the I-you relationship, the machines are always going to be its and fundamentally different from the you's, the I-you. But as they become more and more sophisticated, they will feel like a you. It will feel like a person. It will feel as though you're talking to a person. That's already starting to happen with things like Alexa and Google Home and chatbots and all the rest. And I don't think we've seen anything yet. It's going to get much more sophisticated. But we're going to need to remember, fundamentally, these are its. These are machines. They're not persons. In fact, I even wonder whether there's going to have to be regulations by law. These things will have to say every five minutes, I have to tell you I'm not a person. <laughs> Don't forget, I'm only a machine. Because otherwise, we're in such danger of being sucked into this fantasy that we're talking to a real person. Just looking at the time, we've perhaps got a chance for any other questions or... Um 
I'd just like to know what you think about the idea that religion is a stopgap for our lack of science understanding. Yeah, thanks. That, that's a sort of God of the gaps idea it's often been called, the idea that when uh, science under explains so much and then you get a gap because science has stopped and then religion comes in and says, oh, we can explain that. I, I think that's a misunderstanding personally. You won't be surprised to hear me say that. I think that science and religion are both important, but they ask, answer different kinds of questions. So, as Peter Medawar said, science really cannot answer a question about meaning, about purpose, um, because that's a, not a scientific question. If you ask, what are human beings for? What's the purpose of existence? Even if we had complete scientific knowledge of every single law, would that explain what human being, the purpose of existence, the meaning behind the cosmos, the meaning behind the general law of relativity? Well, does there have to be one? Well, answer, yes, I think so. Because interestingly, as all human beings, we desperately quest for meaning. It, we are, part of our humanity is to try to understand, to see purpose, to, to look for intention. I mean, you see this at a trivial level. Why are we fascinated by, by detective novels or by drama or or human relationships, because we're constantly trying to understand why did he do that, and what was she intending to do there, and so on. All this is, is showing how just part of our humanity is, is a desperate quest for meaning, for purpose. And again, does that make any sense from a Darwinian point of view? No. I mean, it's just some kind of meaningless epiphenomenon. But within a Christian understanding, it does, you know, that we were designed in order to quest out for the purpose and meaning, and ultimately for the meaning of the great drama of the cosmos. Because Christianity says, actually, what's going on here is a vast drama, and it has a narrative arc. It, start, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we're all, whether we know it or not, part of this great drama, and the whole art of living is to understand the drama and to understand that each of us can play, have a bit part we can be bit players in the great drama of the cosmos. And so, in that sense, that's why we do naturally think in terms of meaning. We think in terms of purpose. We think in terms of directionality of history. Well, ladies and gentlemen, time's up, I'm afraid. But can I just ask you to show your appreciation for John Wyatt? Thank you very much, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.